When our building in Dorna that is dedicated to spiritual science is completed, it will in a significant place contain a sculptural group which will depict in particular three figures. At the center of this group there will be a figure who may be seen as the representative of the highest human essence that could develop on the earth. One will therefore also be able to experience this figure of the highest human essence in earthly evolution as the Christ who dwelt within earthly evolution for three years in the body of Jesus of Nazareth. It will be a special task to portray this Christ figure in such a way that one will, on the one hand, be able to see how the being in question is living in an earthly human body, but nevertheless, how in every expression, in everything relating to it, this earthly body is spiritually pervaded by that which entered from cosmic spiritual heights into this earthly body as the Christ in the thirtieth year of its life. Then there will be two other figures, the one to the left and the other to the right of the Christ figure, if I may call this figure that I have indicated with a few words the Christ figure. This Christ figure appears to be standing in front of a rock, which rises up especially in the vicinity of Christ's left side, so that its top extends over his head. Up on the rock there is another figure, a winged figure, but its wings are broken, and because its wings are broken, this figure is falling into the abyss. What will have to be artistically fashioned with particular acuity is the way in which this Christ figure raises his left arm, for through this raising of the left arm of the Christ figure, this falling being breaks its wings. But it should not seem as though Christ had broken the wings of this being, for the whole must be artistically fashioned in such a way that in Christ's raising of his arm it is apparent already in the whole movement of his hand that he has nothing but infinite compassion for this being. But this being cannot bear what is flowing upward through the arm and the hand, and which additionally becomes visible through the indentations that the fingers of the outstretched hand seem to leave in the rock itself. What this being feels as it comes into the proximity of the being who represents the Christ may be expressed in words such as these, I cannot bear it that something of such purity is flowing up toward me. This is what is living in this being, and in so fundamental a way that its wings are broken, and as a result it plunges into the abyss. Herein lies a particularly significant artistic task. You can see what could be lacking if Christ were to be sculpturally portrayed, so that simply by raising his hand a power would stream forth from him that breaks this being's wings and causes it to fall. It should not be portrayed like this, but so that the being should itself bring about its fall. For the being that is depicted plunging down with broken wings is Lucifer. And on the other side, on the right of the Christ figure, where a ledge juts out from the rock, there is a concave cavity. In this cavity there is also a form that has wings, and this winged form is with its arm-like organs directing its attention toward the ledge above. You should therefore visualize the cavity in the rock on the right, and in this cavity a winged being, whose wings are, however, formed quite differently from those of the figure up on the rock. This latter figure has more eagle-like wings, whereas the figure in the cavity has bat-like wings. The figure in the cave has the appearance of being encased within it. One sees it working down there in its fettered state, hollowing out the earthly realm. The figure standing in the middle, the Christ figure, reaches down with his right hand. Thus, whereas his left hand extends upward, his right hand is directed downward. Again, it will be a significant artistic task to portray this, not as though Christ wanted to keep this figure, which is Araman, in bondage, but he has infinite compassion for Araman. But Araman cannot endure this.
he writhes with pain through what radiates from the hand of Christ. And this radiating quality causes the golden veins down below in the cavity to wind around Araman's body like cords and bind him. The same that occurs with Lucifer also happens with Araman. We shall then try to depict this same motif, which is conceived as a work of sculpture, which will stand at a significant place in the building, in the form of a painting, which will express it in a completely different way. And so there will be this group of three figures, Christ, Lucifer, and Araman, in the form of a sculpture, and above it a painting representing the same motif. We are portraying this relationship between Christ, Lucifer, and Araman in our building in Dornach, because spiritual science really does show us in a certain sense that the next task with regard to an understanding of the Christ impulse consists in that man comes to know the nature of the relationship in the world between these three powers of Christ, Lucifer, and Araman. For much has hitherto been said about Christianity and the Christ impulse, but what came into the world through the Christ impulse as a result of the mystery of Golgotha is something that has not become completely clear to people. They speak of the existence of Lucifer and also Araman, but in speaking of them, they often speak as though one must flee from them, as though it would be appropriate to say, I want to have nothing to do with Lucifer and Araman. If the divine spiritual powers, which can be sought in the way I described in yesterday's public lecture, also did not want to have anything to do with Lucifer and Araman, the world would not be able to exist. One stands in the right relationship to them not by saying, Lucifer, I shall flee from him, Araman, I shall flee from him, but by regarding what man has to strive toward as a result of the Christ impulse as the state of equilibrium of a pendulum. The pendulum is in the middle in a state of balance, but it must oscillate to the one side and to the other. It is the same with man's earthly evolution. Man is to oscillate to the one side in accordance with the Luciferic principle and to the other in accordance with the Aramanic principle. But he must maintain his equilibrium by developing what Paul has expressed in the words, Not I, but Christ in me. We must conceive of Christ in his essential activity as being a reality, as a living force. This means that we must be clear that what flowed into our earthly evolution through the mystery of Golgotha was indeed an actual happening. It does not so much matter how well or how inadequately people have understood this until now, but rather that it has been a present reality in the earthly evolution of humanity. Much could be said about what human beings have not hitherto understood about the Christ impulse, and spiritual science will need to make its contribution to the understanding of what flowed from spiritual heights into earthly evolution in the form of the Christ impulse through the mystery of Golgotha. In order to evoke an awareness of how Christ has been actively involved, I shall, and I have also spoken of this elsewhere, draw attention to two moments in the earthly evolution of humanity which are important for the whole development of the Western world. You will know from history what an important moment it was when Constantine, the son of Constantius Chlorus, overcame Maxentius, and Christianity was, through him, introduced into the further evolution of the West. That this could happen, Constantine had to win that important battle against Maxentius, which then led to him making Christianity the state religion of the Western Empire. The whole map of Europe would have become different if this battle of Constantine against Maxentius had not happened. But military strategy, that which the people of that time could achieve with their powers of reason, was not the decisive element in this battle. Something quite different was at work. Maxentius had consulted the so-called Sibylline books, the prophetic oracles of Rome, which caused him to lead his army, which had been well protected within the walls of Rome, into the open field to confront that of Constantine. 
Constantine, however, had had a dream before the battle, in which it was indicated to him that if he marched toward Maxentius, in the sign of the mystery of Golgotha, he would achieve something great. And so Constantine, whose army was a quarter of the size of his adversaries, advanced into battle with the sign of the mystery of Golgotha, the cross at its head. And inspired by the power emanating from the mystery of Golgotha, Constantine won that significant battle through which Christianity was outwardly introduced to Europe. If we call to mind what people at that time understood intellectually of the Christ impulse, we find an endless string of theological quarrels. They argued over whether Christ is eternally equal with the Father and over other similar matters. It has to be said that it does not so much matter what people knew at that time of the Christ impulse, but rather that it was a present reality then, that through Constantine, through a dream that Constantine had, it guided what was to happen. It is the reality of Christ, the real power of Christ, that is important. We only begin to understand what the Christ impulse is from within spiritual science. Another moment was the one when Europe again took a formative step in its development in the struggle between France and England. Of this one can say that if France had not been victorious against England, all the circumstances would have become different. But how did this happen? Until our time, when it must become more and more conscious, the Christ impulse has been working in the subconscious regions of the soul. And in the spiritual evolution of the West, we see how the Christ impulse seeks out those states in the souls of human beings through which it can exert an influence through particular individuals. Legends have preserved for us the way that the Christ impulse can assert itself within the spiritual evolution of the West. In some cases, these legends point back to those ancient pagan times when an understanding of Christianity was beginning to germinate. If the soul does not consciously strive for initiation on the path indicated in title, Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, How Is It Achieved?, but as it were on a natural path and has been imbued with the Christ impulse through a natural initiation, the most favorable time in which this Christ impulse can inspire the soul is the time from Christmas Eve until Three Kings Day, the time from 25 December until 6 January. We can understand this if we clearly understand that for occult knowledge it is totally apparent that our earth is not only what geologists speak about. What geologists speak about is equivalent to man's skeletal structure. But our earth also has the spiritual aspect that belongs to it, and it is into the earth's aura that the Christ has entered. This earth sleeps and is awake just as we sleep and are awake in the course of twenty-four hours. We must also be aware that the earth's state of sleep is during the summer, while its state of wakefulness occurs during the winter. Moreover, the spirit of the earth is most awake during these twelve or thirteen nights from Christmas until Three Kings Day. In olden times, when, as you know from many indications in my lecture cycles, people elevated themselves to the spiritual principle of the world, more in a kind of dreamlike clairvoyance. The most favorable time for this was the summer. It is perfectly natural that anyone wanting to raise themselves to the spirit in a more dreamlike clairvoyance found it easier during the earth's sleep during the summer. Hence the St. John's Festival was in these ancient times the most favorable period for raising the power of the soul to the spirit. But in the place of the old way in which the spirit realm influenced the earth, a new, more conscious way has emerged. And now the best time for this is when the earth is awake. Thus the legends tell us that particularly gifted human individuals, people who are especially suited by virtue of their karma, enter around Christmas time into a particular state of consciousness, which is only similar to sleep but which is inwardly such that it can be inspired by the forces that elevate human beings to the realm that we call the spirit land. There is a very beautiful legend, a Norwegian legend of Olaf Astesen, 
where we are told that he goes to church on Christmas Eve, falls into a sleep-like condition, and then awakes on 6 January, and is able to relate what he has experienced in this sleep-like state. And this Norwegian legend, indeed, tells us how Olaf Astesson experiences something that one first perceives to be the soul world, and then something that one feels to be the spirit land, but everything is expressed pictorially in the form of imaginations. This time was the most favorable in that era when human beings were not yet so advanced as in our time. The time is now past when the Christ impulse is able to stream into human souls through a natural initiation. People today have to be just as conscious of their path of ascent toward initiation as is described in titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds. If we live at a time when natural initiations are becoming ever rarer and will eventually disappear altogether, so that we should no longer be counting upon them. But an initiation which can essentially be called a natural initiation was that through which the Christ impulse influenced the inner being of the simple country girl known as the Maid of Orleans through whom the victory of the French over the English, which in so fundamental a way transformed the map of Europe, was brought about. Again, it was not what could be achieved by human reason, but what guided the maid of Orleans at that time over and above all the strategies of the army generals, and through which Europe acquired a new form, namely the Christ impulse, which worked right into the subconscious of a single individual, but in such a way that From this individual there radiated forth what exerts an influence upon the whole of history. Now, we would need to consider whether there could have been something similar to a natural initiation in the case of the Maid of Orleans. Whether the soul of the Maid of Orleans had been inspired during the nights between 25 December and 6 January. In biographical terms it seems difficult to prove something, such as the maid of Orleans having been in a sleep-like state in the twelve or thirteen days from 25 December until 6 January, in which especially the Christ impulse might have been able to exert its influence upon her, so that as a human being she could have been the vessel of purely the Christ impulse on the battlefields of France. Nevertheless, this is what happened. There is a time that if the karma of the individuality concerned renders this particularly possible, can indeed be suitable for such a sleep-like state to come about. This is the time of the last days in which a human individual is still in the mother's body before he perceives the physical earthly light. He is then living in a dreamlike, sleep-like state. He has not yet perceived with his senses what is taking place outwardly in the world. If by virtue of his karma a person were especially suited to receive the Christ impulse in these last days when he is dwelling in his mother's body, these days would also be days of natural initiation. Such a person would then already be strengthened and fortified by the Christ impulse residing within him by the time that his eyes open for the first time after the initiation. That is, in this case, after birth, and such a person would have to be born on 6 January. The Maid of Orleans was born on 6 January. This is the mystery of the Maid of Orleans, that she was born on 6 January, that she spent the time from Christmas until Three Kings Day in that particular sleep-like state in the body of her mother and received her natural initiation. Now consider the deep connections that stand behind the external developments that we normally refer to as history. What is expounded from documents in history is, by and large, the least important aspect. The simple date indicated in our calendar that the Maid of Orleans was sent into the world on 6 January is of immense historical significance. This is how the forces from the supersensible world work right into the sense-perceptible world, and we must read this occult script through which this influence of the supersensible world upon the world of the senses is made manifest. Thus what was at work in the Maid of Orleans was an in-streaming of the Christ impulse by way of a natural initiation already before her physical birth.
I want to explain these things in order to evoke within your souls a feeling for the fact that behind the scenes of what one ordinarily calls history, powers and associations, of which outward perception has no knowledge, are involved. Since the mystery of Golgotha, however, the Christ impulse has, in particular, been guiding the history of European humanity. Whereas in the Orient, in Asia, a worldview has been retained, of which it can be said that in its feelings and sensibilities it has not yet arrived at the Christ impulse. To be sure, Europeans have allowed themselves to be tempted to regard Indian wisdom as something especially profound. But it is characteristic of this Indian wisdom and the whole religious sensibility of Asia that all its attention is devoted to the time preceding the Christ impulse, while, in addition, it has preserved the state that was present in the religious sensibility of earthly humanity before the Christ impulse. To remain behind in evolution always signifies embracing something of a Luciferic nature, and therefore Asian religious development is the bearer of a Luciferic element. As we consider the religious development of Asia, we cannot but be aware of seeing much in it that mankind once previously had, but which it has had to abandon. But in Western culture we must cleanse all this from the Luciferic element and in part raise it up in such a way that the Christ impulse can flow into it. If we move from Asia to Europe, we find disseminated throughout Eastern Europe, in Russian culture, an Orthodox Christianity that has remained at an earlier stage of Christian evolution that did not want to advance further and wanted to retain something of a Luciferic quality. In short, as we look toward the East, we have what I might say the wise spirits guiding the world and the whole evolution of mankind left behind as the Luciferic element. As we look toward the West, we have a different distinctive quality. The characteristic of this American culture is that everything is sought in externalities, Great and significant achievements result from this. But the answer to everything is sought in the outer world. Let us take an example. When we in Europe, and especially Central Europe, see that someone who had not hitherto had the opportunity to focus his heart and mind upon Christ and the spiritual cosmic forces has suddenly made a complete change in his life, we have an interest in what happened within him to bring this about. We are not so much interested in that he experienced a leap in his development, for one finds this everywhere. Indeed, there is something wholly inappropriate about the claim formulated by modern science that nature does not make leaps. From the green leaf of a plant to a red petal is a mighty leap. From the flower to the calyx is likewise a mighty leap. It is a totally false claim and the truth of evolution rests on the fact that leaps are a regular occurrence. Thus, if someone who has for a while been taken up with external matters is suddenly able to have an inclination toward the spirit, this is not what we find especially interesting, but the inner power and industry that cause what one might call a conversion to a spiritual awareness do indeed interest us. We shall want to look into the deepest feelings of such a person, We want to know what brought him to such a radical change. It is the inner soul aspect that we find interesting. What does an American make of this? He does something quite peculiar. In America, one would have plenty of opportunity to observe such conversions taking place. An American would ask those who have undergone such a conversion to write letters. He would then gather all these letters together into a bundle and say, I have received letters from a number of people. Approximately 200 people have written letters. 14% of all these souls who experienced such a conversion wrote that it was caused by a fear of death or hell that suddenly came over them. 5% claimed altruistic motives. 17% ascribed it to an aspiration for moral ideals. 15% to pangs of conscience. 10% to following teachings that they have been given, 13% to imitating others whom they had seen being converted, 
19% because it was thought that they should be given a good hiding, and so on. In this way one selects the most extreme cases, sorts, and tallies them, and arrives at a result that is based on scientific fact. This is then compiled in books that are published on the theme of soul science. All other ways of arriving at conclusions are unsound, according to these people, and are based on subjective notions, so they say. There you have an example of the externalization of what is most intimate, and it is the same with many other aspects of life in America. At a time that calls for a particular degree of spiritual deepening, spiritism, of the most external kind, is rampant in America. People want to make everything tangible and matter-of-fact there. This is a materialistic conception of spiritual and cultural life. We could point toward many other things through which you would see that the culture of the West is gripped by Aramonic influences. When the pendulum swings to the other side and we look to the East, we have the Luciferic element. If we look toward the West, we have the Aramonic element and the infinitely significant task that we in Central Europe have between East and West is to find the balance. Thus, it is our wish to represent in the form of the sculptural group the greatest of the spiritual demands of our age, finding the balance between the relationship to Lucifer and the relationship to Araman. One will recognize what the Christ impulse wanted of earthly evolution only if one portrays Christ not simply as an entity, but if one knows that Christ is that power that exemplifies for us the balance in the relationship of Lucifer and Araman. That there is as yet no clarity with respect to the relationship of man and of Christ to Lucifer and Araman may be illustrated by means of the following example. Even the greatest things, or things containing a measure of greatness, are not free from the one-sidedness associated with a particular time. It is impossible to overestimate the significance of that picture that Michelangelo painted in the Sistine Chapel in Rome, titled The Last Judgment, a truly wonderful picture, depicting Christ in triumph, directing the good to the one side and the evil to the other. Let us focus our attention upon this Christ. He does not have the kind of features that we want to emphasize in the Christ who is to be represented in our building in Dornach. Here it must become visible that Christ raises his hand in compassion to Lucifer above him. Lucifer should not be depicted as falling because of the power of Christ. He falls of his own accord, because he cannot bear what streams forth from Christ as he approaches him. And Christ looks up as he gestures with his brow toward Lucifer. Moreover, Araman is not overcome by Christ's hatred. He feels that he cannot endure what streams forth from Christ. Christ stands in the middle as the one who brings the Parsifal element into the modern age who through his very being and not through his power induces the others to overcome themselves so that the others overcome themselves rather than being overcome by him. With Michelangelo we still see that Christ through his power sends the one to heaven and the other to hell. This will in future not be the real Christ but a Christ who is very luciferic. Such an observation does not, of course, detract from the greatness of the painting. This can be recognized, but one has to admit that Michelangelo was not yet able to paint Christ, because world evolution had not advanced sufficiently far. It must be clearly understood that one should not direct one's attention only to the Christ, but rather to the threefold form of Christ, Lucifer, and Araman. I can only hint at this, Spiritual science will eventually bring to light the full content of this mystery of Christ in relation to Lucifer and Araman. But now consider the following. If we look toward the east, we see Luciferic powers in our near proximity. And in the west, we see Aramanic powers 
In our spiritual scientific studies, it must be our way to look at things not with sympathy and antipathy, and also to consider nations and folk souls not with sympathy and antipathy, but as they actually are. What one refers to as the national heritage of a person who identifies himself with the character of his people is mainly dependent upon what lives within the physical and etheric body. When we are dwelling as a being of soul and spirit in the form of our astral body and ego, between going to sleep and waking up, we live outside our familiar national identity. Only between waking up and going to sleep, when we are immersed in the physical body, do we partake in our nationality. Thus nationality is also something that a person gradually overcomes during his stay in Kamaloka. And as he overcomes his national identity in Kamaloka, he aspires to the universally human, in order then to live for the greater part of the time between death and a new birth in the realm of the universally human. Thus among the qualities that are laid aside in Kamaloka is that which specializes us in terms of our nationality. In this respect, the various nationalities are very different from one another. Let us, for example, compare someone from France with someone from Russia. The Frenchman has the distinctive quality that he quite particularly adheres to and dwells within what the folk soul imparts to his physical and etheric body during his life between birth and death. This comes to expression in that the Frenchman, not as an individual, but as a Frenchman, has a definite picture of what it is to be French, that it is of primal importance to think of himself as French. But these thoughts that Frenchmen and speakers of Romance languages in general form of their nationality lead to the idea that they have about their nationality being firmly imprinted upon the etheric body. When a Frenchman has passed through the gate of death, he discards his etheric body after a few days, and it then becomes a firmly closed entity that remains for a long time in the etheric world. This etheric body is, for a long time, unable to dissolve, because it is firmly impregnated with the conception that he has of his nationality and these ideas keep the etheric body intact. Thus, if we look toward the West, we see the field of death filled with firmly defined etheric bodies. If we look more closely at the East, at the Russians, the distinctive quality of Russians is that when souls pass through the gate of death, bearing such an etheric body, it dissolves relatively very quickly. This is the difference between the West and the East, the etheric bodies of Western Europeans that are separated out after death have the quality of wanting to maintain their rigidity. What the Frenchman calls gloire imprints itself firmly upon his etheric body as a national gloire, so that he is condemned to direct his attention to this etheric body to look at himself for a long time after his death. Readers aside, I'm attempting this uh, French word spelled G-L-O-I-R-E with a grave over the E, gloire. My pr- apologies for that if it's wrong. And of readers aside. A Russian, on the other hand, looks at himself very little after his death. Through all of this, a person from Western Europe is exposed to the Aramonic influence. This materialization process of the etheric body is under the sway of the Aramonic principle. The diffusion and rapid ascent of the etheric body is accompanied by a feeling of pleasure in the nationality concerned. How does this come to expression in the East? Central Europe does not understand this, just as it does not have an inner feeling for it. If one studies Dostoevsky and even Tolstoy or other leading writers, who are always speaking about the Russian man, This comes over as a feeling of pleasure in the national character, which cannot in itself be defined. We even find with Soloviev how something oppressive lives in his philosophy which Central Europeans cannot reconcile with everything that is active in Europe as a spiritual power. 
In Central Europe, there is an intermediate state, something that could be explained further than was possible in yesterday's public lecture. I said that something exists in Central Europe that is of an inner aspirational nature. Goethe would have written his Faust no differently in the 1840s. Strive ever onward, he would have said. But this striving is deeply inward in nature. It was in Central Europe where the mystics appeared who wanted not only to recognize the divine spiritual world, but to experience it in their own souls. They wanted to experience the Christ event inwardly. Now, if one takes Soloviev, one finds that before all else he proceeds from the thought that Christ historically died once for mankind. This is perfectly correct, but there lives in Soloviev a soul that sees spiritual life rather as a cloud outside himself, a soul that sees that everything has, so to speak, already happened, whereas the Central European demands that each one experiences the Christ event anew within himself. Meister Eckhart would have said something on the following lines to someone like Soloviev, where Soloviev emphasizes repeatedly that Christ had to undergo death in order that man can find his true potential. Meister Eckhart would say, you are viewing Christ as one looks upon something external. What matters is not that we always focus our attention upon historical events, but we must experience Christ within ourselves. We must discover something inwardly that passes through states similar to Christ, at least spiritually, so that the Christ event is experienced anew on a spiritual plane. Now, it may surely seem contrived and fantastic if people today are told that evolution as a whole, and specifically the folk spirit living in the language of Central Europe, has brought it about that this connection of the ego with the Christ impulse, parentheses, capital I dash CH equals Jesus Christus or Jesus Christ, close parenthesis, is imprinted within the German language. Ich is conjoined so that it becomes Ich or I. And as one speaks the word in Central Europe, one is pronouncing the name of Christ. This is how closely one feels the ego or I to be inwardly connected with Christ. This intimate association with the spiritual world in the way that it must be striven for in all areas of cultural and intellectual life in Central Europe is not known either in the West or in the East. Therefore, something needs to happen in the 20th century in order that the Christ principle can correspondingly gradually spread throughout the whole continent of Europe. I have frequently stated in various lecture cycles that that spiritual being, whom we call Michael, became, so to speak, the leading spirit. This leading spirit is now preparing the event, which in the first of my mystery plays is referred to as the appearance of the etheric Christ on earth, an event that must occur in the 20th century. It will then happen that at first a few individual souls and then an ever-increasing number will know that Christ is really here, that he is an earthly presence, but in an etheric and not in an earthly form. This must be prepared. If in the course of the 20th century certain souls were to open their spiritual eyes clairvoyantly, and this will happen, to what is living in the etheric world, they would be disturbed by those etheric bodies that emanate from Western Europe. Their spirit vision would rest first on them, and they would have a distorted perception of the figure of Christ. Michael, therefore, has to fight a battle in Europe. He must contribute something toward the diffusion of these inflexible etheric bodies from Western Europe in the etheric world. To this end, he must take those etheric bodies that readily diffuse, those from the East, and battle with them against the West. The result of this is that since 1879, there has been a mighty battle in the astral world between Russian and West European etheric bodies, and this battle rages through the whole astral world. A mighty battle is indeed going on in the astral world, led by Michael. 
between Russia and France. This is what in the astral world lies at the foundation of the battle now raging in Europe. And just as we are often so staggered to find that something taking place here in the physical world has its counterpart in the spiritual world, so is it the case here. The alliance between France and Russia, which was concluded at the instigation of Araman, and resides in the first instance within the Aramanic realm, as is betokened by the 20 billion francs that France gave to Russia, is the physical expression of a battle that now rages between French and Russian souls, a battle that directly involves Central Europe as it strives in its innermost soul toward an encounter with the Christ. And Europe has fallen victim to the karma that precisely in Central Europe there has tragically to be an experience of what the East and the West and the West with the East, must resolve between one another. The matters that the German element has outwardly to sort out with the French element can be understood only through the fact that the German element lies in the middle between the East and the West and serves as an anvil for both sides. For what is colliding from both sides in Germany is in truth the affair of these two sides. This is the spiritual truth, which is totally different from what is going on outwardly in the physical world. Just think how different the spiritual truth is from what is taking place outwardly in the physical world. This must surely sound grotesque to people today, but it is the truth, even if we find it shocking. But there is something else that is of extraordinary interest. It surely contradicts everything that we can learn from history, that England, having been united with Turkey against Russia, now suddenly must fight with Russia against Turkey. One can understand this contradiction only if one makes the following occult observation. Whereas, here on the physical plane, England, allied with Russia, is fighting against Turkey, what presents itself to occult observation is the following. If one studies this battle from an occult standpoint and views it first on the physical plane and then on the astral plane, it emerges that from a northern perspective, Russia appears to be allied with England, while from a southeastern perspective, there appears to be an alliance of Turkey with England. This is due to the fact that the bond between England and Russia only has a significance on the physical plane, but is not reflected in the spiritual world since it rests wholly on material interests. From below one sees that England and Russia are allied in the north only on the physical plane. In the southeast, looking through the physical plane, one perceives on the astral plane that the English are, in a soul sense, allied with the Turks against Russia. Thus on the physical plane England is fighting on the same side as Russia, while, on the other hand, Russia is being fought by England. This is how we must view the events taking place outwardly, insofar as they manifest themselves as outward history, for what lies behind it is something entirely different. A time will come when people will speak quite differently about present events than happens now. It must be said that there is something thoroughly unpleasant about war literature in general and one aspect of it is particularly unpleasant. It is constantly said that one cannot speak at present about who is to blame for the war and so forth. People like to delude themselves about such things. They say that we shall learn from archived documents who was at fault. With respect to the outward events, however, it is not so difficult to resolve this if one judges dispassionately, and even if he is wrong about certain details, Chamberlain, in his title, War Essays, is right when he says that it is possible to know the key issues about this war. It is true that there is no doubt about that, but one needs to ask the right question. There is, for example, one question which, if it is rightly posed, can be considered quite unequivocally. It is the question, who could have prevented this war? The constantly recurring question, who bears the blame for this war, and many other questions, are not the right ones. 
who could have prevented this war? The obvious answer would be that the Russian government could have prevented it. Only in this way will one be able to find the way to define the impulses that are at work in each situation. Of course, the war that the East has been wanting for decades would not have been able to come about if there had not been a certain relationship between England, Russia, and France, so that one can also, if one wants, ascribe the greater blame to England. But all these conjectures do not take into account the underlying causes that made the whole world war a necessity. It is naive to think that the war could have failed to materialize. People speak now as if this war did not need to happen when it was, of course, part of European karma. I wanted to indicate this by speaking about the contrasts between East and West. It does not so much matter that we raise questions about the outer causes, for these are not important. We simply need to realize that this war is an historical necessity. The specific causes are then unimportant. What is important, however, are all the various effects toward which we must develop the right attitude, and one effect can impress us in a highly significant way. One remarkable characteristic phenomenon is that through such a war many unspent etheric bodies are engendered, and since this is the greatest war that humanity has engaged in since historical records began, this has featured in a major way. Unspent etheric bodies accumulate. After all, a person's etheric body can nurture him for a long time until he is seventy, eighty, or ninety years old. But in time of war, human beings are sacrificed in the prime of their lives. When someone passes through the gate of death, the etheric body, as you know, is expelled after a short time. But in the case of those who have fallen in battle, the etheric bodies that are expelled would have been able to sustain these human lives in the physical body for several decades. In physics, it is recognized that no force is lost. It is similar in a spiritual context. These etheric bodies that pass prematurely into the etheric world continue to have their forces intact. Just think of the countless number of unspent etheric bodies that there are of those who are passing through the gate of death as young men. Moreover, there is something distinctive about these etheric bodies. I should like to illustrate this by means of an example closely connected with our movement and then go on to consider the etheric bodies of the fighters who have passed through death, which will become part of the etheric world in the near future. Last autumn we experienced in Dornach the death of the little son of a family belonging to the Anthroposophical Society and currently employed in the vicinity of the building, the death of seven-year-old Theodor Feiss. The father had previously lived in Stuttgart. He then came as a gardener to Dornach and lived near the building together with his family. He had himself been called up soon after the outbreak of the war and was, at the time of the incident that I want to speak about, in a military hospital. Little seven-year-old Theo was a really sunny child, a wonderful, lovely boy. Now one day the following occurred. We had just had a lecture in accordance with my practice of speaking in Dornach in relation to what was happening with the building. After the lecture, someone came to say that little Theodor Feiss had not returned to his mother since the late afternoon. It was then ten o'clock in the evening, and it was impossible to avoid thinking that a great misfortune had occurred. On this same afternoon, a furniture van had arrived and had taken a direction near the so-called canteen, where there was a bend that it had to negotiate. The van had reached this spot where, it can be said in all confidence, no van of such a size, and perhaps no furniture van of any description, had ever come, and none has come since. Now before the van had reached this little bend, little Theo had been in the canteen. He had been delayed there, otherwise he would have returned home earlier, with the food that he had fetched from the canteen for supper. He then set off home, and it is only a very short distance, at such a time that he was at the very spot where the van overturned and fell on him. No one had noticed the accident. 
not even the coachman, for his main concern had been for his horses when the van had overturned and he did not know that the child was underneath it. When we were notified of the child's absence, we had to try to lift the van. Friends fetched tools and the Swiss soldiers who had been alerted helped us with this. Of course, the child had already been dead since 5.30 in the afternoon. The furniture van had immediately crushed the boy who had died of suffocation. This is a case that can be used as an example of what I have often tried to clarify through a comparison, namely that causes and effects are confused. I have often used the following familiar instance. Suppose that we see someone walking beside a river. This person then falls into the river. Those who see this happening hurry along and find a stone at the spot where he fell into the river and think that he must have stumbled, fallen into the river and died as a result. They therefore say that he died because he fell into the river. But if an autopsy is conducted on him, one may perhaps find that he had had a heart attack and that he fell into the river as a result. He therefore did not die because he fell into the river, but he fell into the river because he was dead. You quite frequently find such confusions of cause and effect in the assessing of life situations and even more so in ordinary science. The situation with little Theo was that his karma had run its course, so that one can indeed say that he had ordered the van to go where it did. I mention the whole case, which was outwardly tragic in the extreme, for the reason that we have here to do with the etheric body of a child which could have sustained the life of this child for decades. This etheric body is passed into the spiritual world with all its unused forces. Where is it? Since then, anyone obliged to work with artistic intentions on the building in Dornach, or is simply quietly pursuing thoughts within its confines, knows, if at the same time he is gifted with occult perception, that the whole of this etheric body is expanded in the aura of the Dornach building. We must make the distinction that the individuality is elsewhere. It goes its own way. But the etheric body that was expelled after a few days is now present in the building. And I shall never hesitate to say that among the forces that one needs for intuition are the forces of this etheric body which was sacrificed for the building. The relationships behind ordinary life are often totally different than one is supposes. This etheric body has become a protective power for the building. There is something of immense significance in such a relationship. And now consider what a vast amount of power rises up into the spiritual world in the unspent etheric bodies of those who are now passing through the gate of death on account of the events of the war. Things are connected quite differently than people may imagine. The karma in the world is fulfilled in a wholly different way. Spiritual science has to be prepared to put spiritually true ideas in place of fantastical imaginings. We can, to give just one example, barely conceive of anything more fantastic and untrue than something that has occurred in the last few decades. One may well ask what has been accomplished as a result of the establishing of a special, in quotes, peace treaty in order to replace war with law, with international law, as it was called. At no time in human history have such terrible wars occurred since the peace society has existed. And in the last two years this peace movement has had, among special patrons, the monarch who has waged the bloodiest and most terrible wars that have ever been conducted in world history. Thus the initiating of the peace movement on the part of the Tsar must appear as the greatest farce that has ever been perpetrated in world history, the greatest farce, and at the same time the most abominable. This is what should be called the Luciferic temptation of the East. One can say that it makes a shocking impression on the soul when one sees, however, one may wish to view the situation, that at the outset, when the war impulse was making its presence felt in Europe, people had assembled in Central Europe and moreover in the German Parliament in Berlin and hardly said anything at all. 
Little was said, but events spoke for themselves. There was, however, endless talk both in the West and in the East. But in a certain sense, one receives the most shocking impression from what was said by the various parties in the St. Petersburg Duma. The representatives in the Duma uttered all manner of meaningless clichés with the greatest fire of enthusiasm. It was shocking. But the Luciferic temptation was at work here. All this indicates to us that the fire that is burning in this war is a warning that people must truly heed. Everything that is now happening points toward the need for a few souls to say to themselves, things cannot continue in the world as they are at present. A spiritual element must flow into human evolution. Materialism has found its karma in this most terrible of wars. In a certain sense, this war is the karma of materialism. The more human souls perceive this, so much the more will they stop discussing whether this or that faction is to blame for the war and will say to themselves, this war has been sent into world history as a warning that we should turn toward a spiritual conception of human life as a whole. Materialism does not only make the souls of human beings materially oriented, but it also perverts logic and dulls the feelings. Within Central Europe, people are still far from fully understanding the implications of what I have been saying, that in Central Europe there needs to be an intimate understanding of the continuing development of the Christ impulse. But this means, among other things, that a start must be made with understanding those individuals who have already sown the seeds for this. Just one example. Goethe wrote a theory of color. Physicists regard this as something that they smile sympathetically about when they say, what did the poet understand about color? He was a dilettante. Since the 1880s, I have been laboring to gain acceptance for Goethe's theory of color against the tide of modern physics. People cannot understand it. Why can they not understand it? Because the materialistic principle which emanates from the British folk soul has gained its entry into Central Europe. Newton, whom Goethe had to oppose, has gained the victory over what in Goethe derived from the spirit. Goethe also established a theory of evolution, in which it is shown how, through the embracing of spiritual laws, beings advance from the least to the most perfected state. This has been too difficult for people to understand. When Darwin brought his theory of evolution expressing this in a simplified form, people understood this. Darwin was victorious over Goethe. The materialistic thinker who is inspired by the British folk soul has prevailed over Goethe, who derived his insights from the most intimate dialogue with the German folk soul. Ernst Haeckel's experience was a tragic one. He was intellectually nourished throughout his life by what Huxley and Darwin have given him. Ernst Haeckel's materialism is fundamentally an English product. Now when the war broke out, Haeckel was furious about what emerged from the British Isles. He was one of the first to return British medals, diplomas and honors. However, what should be returned are not these decorations and insignia, but British Darwinism and physics. One needs to come to this point of view in order to see how Central Europe can strive toward an intimate dialogue with the laws of the world. The greatest damage is done when one fills a child's soul with what goes on to develop further in a purely materialistic way. This has been on the increase for centuries. Araman has inspired a British author of considerable standing to write a book that was specifically calculated to influence the soul materialistically from childhood in such a way that one does not notice because one does not see all this as preparing for a materialistic view. This is Robinson Crusoe. The whole manner in which Robinson is described is so ingenious that once the ideas underlying this saga have been imbibed, they prepare the mind in such a way that it can later only think materialistically.
Humanity has not yet been healed from the inventors of such tales. They existed before and are still with us now. This is not to say anything derogatory about the peoples of the West, who have to be as they are. My intention is, rather, to indicate how people in Central Europe must find the connection with the great values with respect to future developments that are as yet only in germinal form. Austria has a quite particular part to play in this regard. In recent decades, one could see how individuals, such as Hammerling, in the realm of literature, have aspired to the highest ideals, as has Carneri, who wanted to extend Darwinism to encompass the moral realm, and also Bruckner and other artists working in a variety of different fields. It is important that a people has an awareness of such things. Now, let us consider the unspent etheric bodies that are in existence. These etheric bodies have been cast off by those who had learned in the course of a great event to sacrifice themselves for something that, at any rate ostensibly, no longer exists for them, for their people. If, as a spiritual scientist today, one speaks of a folk soul in terms of an archangel, one will be ridiculed. What a materialist calls a folk soul is merely the abstract sum of the qualities that the people belonging to a particular folk share. When he refers to a people or folk, he has in mind simply the totality of human beings living together in the same geographical area and with a common outlook. When we speak of a people or nation, we do so out of the knowledge that the folk spirit is present as a real being of the rank of an archangel. Even if someone who sacrifices himself by going through death for his people has no proper awareness on the field of battle of a real folk spirit, he confirms through the manner in which he dies that he believes in an existence that continues beyond death, that he believes that there is more to a people and its culture than what meets the eye, E.Y.E., namely its connection and its interplay with the supersensible world. Thus, regardless of their awareness of this, all those who pass through death are confirming as they do so that there is a supersensible world, and this is imprinted upon their etheric bodies. Thus, when peace has been re-established, in addition to those who will be living in the physical earthly world, there will be the unspent etheric bodies continually sending forth tones to the music of the spheres, declaiming that there is more in the world than what can merely be seen with physical eyes. Spiritual truth will sound forth into the music of the spheres through what the dead leave behind in their etheric bodies, wholly irrespective of what they take with them with their individuality that they retain throughout their life between death and a new birth. But what lives in and resounds from these etheric bodies must be heard because these etheric bodies have been laid aside by those who have passed through death, affirming the truth of the spiritual world. It will be mankind's greatest sin not to listen to what those who have died call out to us by means of the awakening cries of their etheric bodies. And as one looks up to the spiritual world, how infinitely one's perception will be enlivened if one considers that the fathers and mothers, the sisters and brothers, sons and daughters, who have lost their loved ones, must be saying to themselves, what has been sacrificed continues to live for the whole of humanity as an awakening call for what is to come. If one were to rely merely upon what is taking place in the physical world, one might not have much hope for the successful continuation of the spiritual movement that is being nurtured out of our spiritual scientific world conception. What a good faithful colleague died recently, aged around 30, in the words that I directed toward this soul that crossed the threshold of death. I asked that it might work with us in our spiritual scientific endeavors as faithfully and courageously as it had here on earth utilizing everything that it had come to know. This colleague has worked industriously with us on the physical plane. In my 
words to him in this life between death and a new birth. I ask that he might work with us after death as he has done before he died. For we count upon these dead people, the so-called dead, as we do on the living. Our spiritual scientific world conception must be so alive as to bridge the gulf between the so-called dead and the living that we feel the dead among us as if they were alive. We want not theory, but life. Thus we also want to point out that when peace is resumed, there will be a living bond between those living on the earth and those who have passed through the gate of death. People will be able to learn from the dead how they are collaborating in the manner indicated in the great spiritual progress that must encompass the earth. It sometimes happens in life that one sees that human logic does not alone suffice. I should like to offer an example, not for personal reasons, but in order to characterize the way that people relate to our movement. Some years ago one could read an article in a well-respected South German journal that a famous modern philosopher had written about our spiritual science. And because the article was written by a great philosopher, spiritual science was portrayed in such a way as to make a certain impression on the readers of the journal. The editor of the journal took great pride in the fact that he was able to publish an article about spiritual science by such a famous man. Of course, the picture that he presented of spiritual science was unfavorable, and the facts were distorted. But what did it take for the editor to see what kind of a judgment he had conveyed in his monthly journal about our movement? The war broke out. The man who had written the article wrote some letters to the editor. These letters contained some of the most repulsive things that it is possible to say about Central European culture, upon which he poured his mockery and scorn. The editor now published these letters as an example of how foolishly it is possible to think about this culture, adding that the only place for a man who writes like this is a lunatic asylum. So, the fact is that something of this kind was necessary for the good editor to see that the man who several years before had written this article about spiritual science, which had severely damaged the movement's public image, belongs in a madhouse. But if he now belongs in a madhouse, so did he also belong in one when he wrote an article about spiritual science. This is the way of the world. Additional help is needed beyond what is available to people today to form a judgment. The spiritual scientist stands firmly on the ground that clearly shows that the truth eventually finds its path. But spiritual science must exert its influence within human evolution in order that what is necessary occurs. And so, as at that time when the Emperor Constantine had his task to fulfill the Christ impulse, had subconsciously to intervene from the spiritual world, as with the Maid of Orleans the Christ impulse had to bring its influence to bear in order that what had to happen did indeed happen, so must the Christ impulse continue to work further, though now more consciously. There must in future be souls who will know that up there in the spiritual world those who have sacrificed themselves as individuals are calling us to follow them in the belief in the efficacy of the spiritual world which they have attained in death. And the forces from unspent etheric bodies are sending their call into the future, a call that one only needs to understand in order to receive it into one's own soul. But there must be souls down below that hear this call. There must be souls that prepare themselves through the right, living understanding of our spiritual science. Our spiritual science must foster souls here on earth that are able to sense what the etheric bodies of the dead will speak in the future. Souls that know that up there reside the forces that are able to evoke a sense of urgency within human beings who had to be left to themselves on earth. And when spirit-conscious souls direct their attention to the hidden sounds of the spiritual world, the right fruits will arise from all the blood that has flowed, the sacrifices that have been made, 
on the sorrow that had to be borne and will continue to be borne. In the hope that many, many souls may come together through spiritual science, and hear the voices that will sound forth from the spiritual world, especially through this war. I should like to speak words that summarize the concluding part of what has been said today and which express the feelings that I wish to evoke within your souls. Quote, from the courage of the fighters, from the blood on fields of battle, from the grief of the bereaved, from the people's sacrifice, there will ripen fruit of spirit if souls will turn in consciousness toward the realm of spirit. Close quote. With such feelings in our hearts, we want constantly to imbue ourselves with the meaning of the Rose Cross, so that we may rightly view it as the motto for our working, weaving, and feeling. Not the Black Cross alone. Anyone who would tear the roses from the black cross and has only the black cross, would fall prey to Araman. The black cross represents life in its aspiration toward lifeless matter. Nor will anyone who tears the cross from the roses and wishes to keep only the roses find the right path. For the roses, when separated from the cross, want to elevate us to the spirit. But this life would seek egotistically to strive only toward the spirit and not make the spirit manifest within the material realm. Not the cross alone, not the roses alone, but the roses on the cross, the cross bearing the roses, both in harmonious interplay. That is what our true symbol should be.